Jimmy K here, Metal Voice. Look at this. The Metal Voice shirts are now on sale. Just go to the video description to find out on how you can purchase one. Metal! Let everybody know, Jimmy and I were doing small talk before this started, but now the talk is going to get large. <laughs> That's right. Here we go. On the Metal Voice today, Rick Emmett, of course, of Triumph guitarist, solo artist, and... Solo, solo, solo artist, and now author. Yes, right? poet. Yeah. Reinvention, poems, but I don't know. I found it was more of a uh, biography than a book of poetry. At least I was reading. I mean, there is, of course, there is that that rhyme, right? That that sort of uh, or, poetry or aspect. yeah, sometimes not even rhyme, just just the phrasing and the the flow. Yes. And there's a type of poetry called ultra talk, which kind of it's a license. It's almost like you're writing prose sometimes, you, you, it, although there is a poetic nature. And of course, you know, I'm a singer and uh, and a lead guitar player. My whole life has been about phrasing and, you know, trying to find the poetic structure in music. So it's not a huge leap, but you're right about the autobiography stuff. I mean, that was really, that was a big part of it that I was kind of uh, trying to have this therapeutic thing that was going on where where i started writing and um yeah trying to come to terms with you know getting older and all of the rest of that so yeah what, why not why not an autobiography then like why not just take well, that extra coming. step okay yeah it's coming the, the memoir is coming but uh in typical rick emmett sort of style i decided i was going to mishmash a bunch of stuff you know uh and and um try and reach for a sort of a higher aesthetic before I, you know, had to buckle down to deal with. See, memoir stuff is more like people want the anecdotes and they want the stories and, and what was it like to have been there? And, and uh, that there, there's almost like a reporting angle to that. Um, whereas with poetry, I felt like I had a lot more license. I could do say things the way I wanted to try and say it. And, 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 um, you know, um, I just felt like, uh, I was going to take that step, uh, towards a world that's more, uh, Gord Downey and, 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 um, Leonard Cohen and, uh, you know, uh, and, and just take a baby step towards that. You know, I'm not necessarily putting myself on that level. This is only my first attempt. You know, so do you find like it's cryptic in a way and that kind of protects you because, you know, you sometimes, you know, what's what it means to you might people might not actually see it, but you're kind of saying it, but you're not really saying it. Yeah, I, I think that and I think that's you, you're kind of spot on there that poetry can be elliptical. It can be illusory. It can be, um, um, you know, it can be like. You know, I, I when I was a teenager, I really loved uh, the band Yes, and John Anderson's lyrics were just sometimes like right out there, so elliptical you couldn't possibly figure out what he was talking about. Crystals, crystals. He was talking about crystals. I was talking, <laughs> well, he's a very spiritual guy, right? So, yes. so th th there's a certainly that kind of deep cosmological spiritual stuff is in there. It's just we're going. Yeah, I think I sort of get a sense of it, but I'm not really sure I understand what you're driving at. But, but and poetry has that. There's no question. Uh, even though, you know, I mean, as a songwriter, I've always tried to be, may, try to make it clear, try to make it so that people hear it the first time and they get it, you know, the first time that they hear it, which is, I didn't always stick to that. You know, sometimes I, I would make it a little harder for people than, than, than just first listen, but um, generally speaking, I, I don't. I don't think my poetry book is too hard to to, to chew at. You know, um, although yes, sometimes I'm hiding a little bit behind the words or trying to make it so that instead of um, you know just sort of pissing and moaning and kvetching about whatever, you know, I, I'm actually sort of trying to say, okay, how do I uh, how do I get over to virtue from vice? You know, how do I make that flip? And I think in poetry, it's a little easier to do that than if you're just writing a standard autobiography memoir where you're going, okay, so 
then I was here and this is what we did and this is what happened on that day and and you know this is how I felt about it and you know that's more like a kind of a reporting storytelling and I'm gonna have to cope and deal with that that the memoir is part of my book deal so is it, how long until the memoir is released yeah well how long till I can get it finished um the back end of my website has a forum where uh, I uh, have communicated with fans for a couple of decades. And so I asked my webmaster, hey, Adrian, can you uh, compile all of my posts there so, you know, make it into a one document so that I can, she goes, well, it's going to be pretty big. And it was like single spaced, way over 5,000 pages. So Mm -hmm. I have narrowed that down to about 400 and change now. So Mm -hmm. I'm close with that source of material. That's not to say that I'm not going to, especially after the experience of, of um, writing poetry, I'm, I'm not going to want to go at it again from a different angle, tell some slightly different stories. Uh, you know, I really feel like, um, you know, I mean, I've been writing all of my life, wrote guitar player magazine columns. I wrote, you know, I, I wrote songs since I was 10 years old. Mm-hmm. Um, but you know, here I am in my senior years and I'm starting to feel like I'm just learning about writing in new ways, which I find very exciting. Let's, it's kind of, you know, you held mm-hmm. up the book, like this is a cool thing that, that got my... you know, sort of all of my life. There we go. Yeah. We're both doing it. Fuck, it's a commercial. Um, like to hold that in my hand is actually, it. I said to a guy yesterday, it's like when I forgot to hear my song on the radio for the first time, you know, like, it's it's an exciting thing and it's something that I kind of always wanted to do in my life. So, you know, now that I'm started, I, I'm I don't want to necessarily just put out a memoir just to have put it out. I really want to try and write something that makes an attempt at literature, even if, you know, uh, maybe I'm not exactly a, a you know I don't I don't have a doctorate or anything. So we'll see how it works out. Well, you've got the experience, that's for sure. Okay, so give everybody a skeleton of a blueprint of what they can expect with, there we go, the ad. Here's the ad again. <laughs> yeah. Do, do you want me to read one? Well, no, one? if you want to read. You want yeah, to read well, you know, a favorite line? On these Zoom All right. things, they've been asking me if I if I want to read one. Read a favorite so, line. How's that? I, I could read a favorite line that I saw. But yeah, okay, go yourself. ahead. Well, yeah, no, do you that can go me. ahead. You're, 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 you're the well, author. Well, it's your show, Jimmy. <laughs> Well, you, you should be reading what you think is okay, okay. All right, um, here we go I'll, I'll give you one and you give me one how's that okay all right, all right fair enough it's like it's like we're jamming here all right good i was a i was the junior partner who got voted on things that never really mattered and who got managed and manipulated into much of the rest yes uh who got outvoted that uh, who yeah. got outvoted yeah, outvoted on things that really mattered and got managed and manipulated into much of the rest. And the reason I can say that so quickly is because I had it open to exactly the same page. I was going to read. Wow, I was going to read from that same Cause, poem cause, because because it says so much, right? It, yeah, it, 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 yeah, it relates to the also. I mean, you know, your show's a metal show, so it relates to the time that I was in the rock and roll machine and 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 uh, feeling the crunch of that. You know, so. Yeah, uh, the, 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 the chunk before the one that you just said is, to the front of house, I was a barking seal, an organ grinder's monkey, a clawless, clueless, toothless tiger, leaping around on platforms at the crack of a whip, the poke of a chair. So, you know, to me... Like, so go ahead, explain. Well, the thing that that I loved about oh, I poetry was that I was able to sort of constantly be having these metaphors, but I didn't have to try and find rhyme schemes. I didn't have to try and fit them into like song architecture. You, you could literally just let this idea expand itself until it said what you wanted it to say. And it might take two lines, it might take four lines, but it, there's a nice distillation to poetry. And, you know, what I was talking about there is that, you know, people see you up there under the lights doing, and they think you're this, you know, powerful, you know, amazing, wonderful, it's it's great. And it is, I'm not saying that it isn't, but when you're inside it, 
it's also like being a tiger in a zoo, which is like, go ahead, you know, uh, gr growl and, and jump up and down. Yeah. And, and, you know, claw at the air, but really mm -hmm. then they're going to make you stand, sit on that thing and poke you with the chair. And then when, the, you know, they give you the signal, you're going to run out through the tunnel and, you know, the show's over. Like th there's a thing about show business where, you know, and, and everybody's in it, you know, I don't care. Heavy metal folk, jazz you know you're in show business and so it's a business of showing you know that's what it is so you know that that poem in particular that that was uh, one in a series of four so the first one was called invention and then there was reinvention sort of part two and then part three and part four my life i have reinvented myself constantly and so you know here i am talking to you and I'm I'm in a new stage. You know, you, you know what? I, and and it's out voting, you know, and, and I don't know, I guess it just really hit me hits home because if you're constantly being outvoted and you're never being heard, that's where you grow frustrated, right? I yeah. mean, was that really I guess we'll see that in the documentary that's coming up, right? But was that really how you felt that your your voice wasn't being heard? And you know what I mean by voice. I mean you're right. Yeah, not enough. And, and, you know, here's the thing, like in Triumph, when we first started, it's a trio. And that is a, like a perfect little democracy. It's as small as you can get and still have a perfect democracy. And in the early stages, uh, it was like it was as if the other guys, there would be discussion and, you know, my voice would be taken seriously. And, and uh, we were building something. But once it got built to a certain point, there was an imbalance that existed. You know, Gil was the general manager of the band. It was really his thing. Mike was the guy that, you know, dealt with the record company and did the marketing and the promotion. And so then there were, when there were things where I was going, hang on for a second, you know, I, I think direction wise, we should be doing this. It was like, sorry, Rick, you're getting outvoted. And I was getting outvoted on too much stuff to the point where it was like, well, clearly I'm not going to be able to, and, and, you know, in the early stages of Triumph, here's an example. You know, I think the other guys wanted it to be a very metal, hard rock kind of thing. But I was the one that was going, yeah, yeah, yeah. I was the guy that was going, well, you know, Blinding Light Show, like, how about we do this? And, and, and uh, you know, it's a little bit more progressive. And the lyric is a little bit more progressive. And you know, I'll put a classical guitar solo in the middle of it. And they went, okay, yeah, sure, that's great. But then as time was going on... It, that was getting bled out. And we weren't a hard rock band anymore because of what was happening at, at MCA and Universal and stuff. So there wasn't even the integrity that I find that metal has, that hard rock has. Um, because sometimes heavy metal can be like... Mm, Limited. Like right. Gustav Holst. It can be big. It can be huge. It, it's so powerful, you know. Uh, and, and I dig that. I really like that. But we were turning into a pop band, you know, like a, and and I don't think any of us liked it, but the other guys were, they were kind of going, well, yeah, but this is where the bread is buttered, and I was going, I don't care about butter, <laughs> you know, I and I mean, you know, here I am a poet after doing jazz, guitar. and you didn't even know it, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, so you know, it's it's like. Uh, sometimes money is making a machine do what a machine is doing. And then I'm kind of, I lose interest, you know, but I, I would think that the record company did take care of you. Like there's a lot of, I do for years, I've been doing interviews and the biggest complaint was the record company never paid us or they never paid us fairly to what I think they should have paid us. But I get the sense that triumph was always okay in that part I don't know. I just, that's the language I'm seeing from you guys. Like, you know, the, the body language or like what you do trying, because you guys would have been on tour for the last 30, 40 years. If that wasn't the case. I mean, again, you know, I'm just asking the question. Yeah. Um, first of all, you know, imagine the difference between being say a beetle and a rolling stone. So beetles, they, you know, they were like in a, in the same kind of way they were, they were going, well, we're going to, we're not even going to go on the road anymore. You know, we don't have to. Steely Dan goes, you know, we're not going on the road. We, we don't have to. And there was a time in, in the music world where bands could make those decisions. But the Rolling Stones didn't sell anywhere near as many records as the Beatles did. And they didn't uh, get as much airplay. 
the Beatles were getting airplay everywhere all the time. So you can imagine what those checks look like. Like if you're Elton John, you know, Paul McCartney, those airplay checks are rolling in and they're gigantic because you're getting played everywhere in the world. The Rolling Stones didn't get that much airplay. And the heavier your band gets, the -hmm. less you're getting airplay, you know, the more you cross over to softer formats of radio, the more you put out ballads and, you know, the, 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 the more airplay you get. So that's a whole other revenue stream. Now, Triumph, we, we managed ourselves. So there wasn't a big slice coming off the top, like 20% of the gross that's going to a management company that, you know, so we didn't need as big a pie as other bands did in order to be, you know, there's money from merchandising, there's money from touring. And in fact, Triumph probably made more money from that stuff than we ever did from selling records, you know. Um, So that was never as big a thing. And the other thing is, you know, in Triumph, Mike and Gil, very astute business people. And um, they really knew right from the get go what it was that they were trying to to achieve on on a whole bunch of levels. So it wasn't like um, there was an ignorance or a naivete to what was happening there. No way. It was like, no, there was an awareness. And so, um, you know, I learned an awful lot at the feet of those, (laughs) the masters. And, Mm -hmm. you know, uh, you know, I I think at a certain point it just became – that, I, you know, they were going to run their thing, the Triumph Rock Roll Machine, the way that they were going to do it. And I went, I got to go. See ya. All right. So going back to the book, being a kid watching the Toronto, there's a lot of Canadiana in this, right? Being a kid watching the Toronto Maple Leafs and then, oh my God, now you're playing on the stage, right? Where the Maple Leafs, I mean, tell yeah. me about that. Well, I mean, it was a, the, the you know, People really should get the book and read the into <laughs> book because there <laughs> we go. Page five. Um, no, page six. Yeah. No. Uh, th- uh, first of all, that when I originally wrote that, it was a, a prose piece for a friend of mine named Kevin Shea, and he had a book called The Blue and White Voices of the Leafs or something. And it was like, Hey Rick, will you write something? And so when I was doing the poetry book, I had this piece and I went, you know, this is kind of like ultra talk. I-, I could really sort of just revise this, change a word here and there change the rhythm of it slightly, but I didn't change it much at all from Kevin's book, but it was really just a thing of what did it mean to be a kid growing up, you know, where we would have Leafs jerseys playing ball hockey out on the street and be doing the play by play from the, you know, the radio guys and the, and the TV guys. And, and, and uh, so my, you know, in the poem, my, my grandmother, well, I guess it was originally my grandfather, but he died had a heart attack and died, but my grandmother had inherited the tickets, Maple Leaf Gardens tickets, North End Blues. And so every season, my dad would get a chance to be able to take my, my brother and I down to these games. And we, you know, so you'd see this thing, you'd see it in black and white on the TV, but to be there in living color, oh my God. And anybody that was, you know, part of my generation age growing up, that was this unbelievable thing that that here was this mythical place, Maple Leaf Gardens, where, you know, these larger than life hockey heroes played. And so, you know, but back to the triumph thing, when the band's first starting, like I said, the other guys were very astute and there was a, there was a kind of a cockiness to the band. So we were supposed to play Massey Hall. We We played you know, clubs and bars and high schools. And we'd risen to a certain point where we had done a few little small concerts in small places. And it was like, okay, we're going to play Massey Hall. And the promoter, uh, uh, Cole, Michael Cole and CPI, they go, okay, they wouldn't let us use the flash pots, the the venue. They said, you can't use your lasers and your flash pots and your flamethrower and all that stuff. And we went, well, we got to have that. You know, so so we said, well, if we, you know, we said to Michael Cole, let's move the show to the concert pool at Maple Leaf Gardens. And he said, are you nuts? Like Massey Hall is a couple of thousand seats. If, if I take you to the concert pool, that's like 7,000 seats. Like you're not big enough. No, you, you haven't had enough airplay for that. Not going to happen. And so the other guys in the band said, Michael, if we lose money, we'll write you the check. Like we'll cover the loss if we lose, but we're not going to lose. We're going to play that show and it's going to be a huge success. And Michael 
I was like, you guys are so cocky. Holy shit. Okay. All right. Let's try it. So we did. And then I got to you drive down in a limo and go into the bowels of Maple Leaf Gardens and walk out on a stage and go, this place, this place when I was a little kid and sat up on those seats, here I am on this stage, you know. And tonight my name's on the marquee. And then what happened? We 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 pretty much sold out. And Michael Cole put Maple Leaf jerseys in the dressing room when we came off stage and go, hey, a Borea solving for jersey. All right, you know, so... Yeah, that's, that's the story of that poem. That's a cool story. So um, what about, and and the sad part of it is your brother, the passing of your brother, right? You know, and would come, you know, come triumph, there's tragedy, right? And just a little bit about that. I mean, he he's sort of like that reunion, that Sweden rock reunion, you know, he's kind of, tell me about how he sort of, that was his last, I don't know if it was last wish, but it was sort of connected, right? Yeah, I mean, it, uh, it took me a long, like, I couldn't talk at his, his funeral, you know. And so the eulogy is kind of those poems in that book. And uh, But when he was passing away, he, he had asked me, you know, don't you think, can't you bear the hatchet with those guys? Can't you figure out a way to get get back and and give all the fans everywhere? And him too. It was like, this is... This is what I would really want, you know. I'd want to see you guys back being friends again, and and um, and I said, okay, I'm going to try for you. I'll try. <laughs> so you know that eventually led to Triumph playing in Sweden, and I took some of his ashes, I put them under the stage there. It was a uh, yeah, yeah. It's a nice story. Um, did you and the guys in Triumph have that much animosity between each other all those years? Uh, it was bad when it when it went bad. It went as bad as bad can get, and I think all three guys would say that. And it was there for a long time—eight years, you know, ten years. Um. So, uh, and it was a long way back. <laughs> like it wasn't easy when when we first sat down in a coffee shop together. Like there were, there was a herd of elephants in that room, you know. Um, but, you know, the thing about forgiveness that's, uh, and this is in the poetry book too, that, that forgiveness. <laughs> forgiveness. Rock and roll and forgiveness right here. Well, you know, you, you have to find it within yourself. You do. Uh, and get past your own ego, the, the your own vanity, the, the things that make you hold on to your anger, you know. We got too much of that in this world now. You know, people storming the Capitol and, you know, people that are unhappy about vaccine passports. And there's just too many people that are holding on to their their own anger. And, and you know, if, if we're going to get along, you have to learn how to let go of that. You have to learn. You have to teach yourself how to forgive. And it's not easy. I can tell you that as somebody that, wanted to hold on to that bitterness and that jaundice is like, you know, tooth and nail. Like, But but you have a reason to unite, you know, and that's, you know, the, the, the documentary that's coming up on September 10th, I believe. Right. So yeah. This man. is coming out September 13th, I think. Right. September 14th for the book. 14th for September the book. September 10th for the documentary. It's like this fall is turning into. And September 12th, the Metal Hall of Fame. So everybody to tune into that. That's a, yeah. a live acceptance speech we're not going to talk too much about that because we don't want to give it away but everybody could tune in on volume.com metal hall of fame to watch Good. try and be inducted into the metal hall of fame on september 12th the, the folks should see the the award we got too it's it's a it's like a bass drum that's got a flying v that's impaled itself right into the bass drum so <laughs> there's a skull in there too i think it's on the face of the bass drum so yeah. it's very heavy it's very metal <laughs> So, and then, of course, the documentary. What can you tell us about the documentary? You looked at it. And I'm sure, you know, when you look at something, your life on the, you know, on the big screen or a little screen, there are things you say, wow, that was cool. And then there's other stuff. Maybe it's cringe moments. Maybe it's, it's, what were the pros? What were the cons that you felt? I mean, again, you know, it's, you, you have to, warts and all, you got to show it, right? But yeah, I mean, well, the... yeah, yes, you know, you say warts and all, and I think it's the and all 
that that uh, I would take issue with because a documentary, first of all, Banger Films made it, and they've done this before. They've done it for Iron Maiden, they've done it for Rush, they've done it for Alice Cooper and ZZ Top. I mean, these guys, they're experienced, and and uh, so, but they're telling their perspective of the story. They've done their research, and they, they, then they've decided, well, this is the angle we're going to take. So that's the first lens you're getting. The other thing is, it's not my story because I was only a part of Triumph. And in fact, I don't actually own that brand. Gil owns that brand. So you're going to get a little bit more of Gil's angle of it than Rick's. And that's fine. You know, I, I, I'm cool with that. But, you know, I, that, the, in truth and in fairness, I think people need to know that. That's what you're going to see. You're going to see something that's been, you know, passed through those filters. So, you know, is this okay? Have all three guys signed off on this? Yes. So, but you, so, but you're not getting my story. You're, you're, you know, you might but, see. Little... But, but maybe, maybe your story is your perception, right? And then you need those three fighting perceptions to get the real story, right? Yeah, sure. <laughs> Except, you know, it's my story, what is, Jimmy. What is real? I don't know what real is. Yeah. All I can tell you is this. Sometimes I think I'm always right. And this is my perception of what right is. But somebody else's truth might be also right. But it's just not my perception of it. But maybe a mix of them together creates the truth. I don't know. Maybe I'm yeah. getting just too philosophical. No, no. But, you know, I mean, I used to do this in, in my own, uh, in my classes at, at uh, Humber when I was teaching in college and we talking about music business. And I would take something like, you know, a can of Coke and put it on the table. And I would say, tell me the truth of this. T tell me the absolute truth about this can. And somebody says, well, it's it's red and silver. I said, what if you were under the table? You, can, you can't see the red. That's right. So truth is, is perspective. Truth is a point of view. And, and um, everybody has, you know, everybody understands that. It's just everybody also has this sort of, ego thing where they go yeah but my truth is is better than his you know, my my truth is way more important than hers you know that's so right. and and that's that gets back to that vanity thing again about how you have to let go so the documentary you know you're talking about trying to find truth from an integration and i'm saying compromise and collaboration yes you get a kind of an integration but what i'm showing you here that's only two dimension, you know. There's there's more to this than than just what you see. So, you know, um, one of the lovely truths of and one of the stories that Banger does is they we tied this thing together where the band got back together and actually played. So there's this little performance that takes place where they invited like the 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 most loyal of Triumph fans into this place. And, you know, at the warehouse at Metalworks. And, and we played three songs for these folks. And it was an unbelievable feeling. It was like standing in a jet engine and just feeling this powerful thing, you know. And there were cameras. They were all over the place. They had, you know, probably 20 cameras shooting this thing. So it's pretty cool, you know. Uh, it's a pretty interesting moment in life. And not too many folks get to experience that kind of thing, you know. So a documentary is really cool that it can accumulate a lot of these moments. The, the, the helicopter flying over the US Festival and seeing these people on the heavy metal day. Oh, my God. You know, like, now imagine getting up and playing in front of those people. Not too many people get that in their life. I did. You know, so. you know it, it's amazing because growing up a Canadian and growing up in Montreal, Triumph was like a big deal, right? Like a really big deal. And people didn't realize the magnitude of the popularity of Triumph. And of course, because the band hasn't been active, there's like a generation that hasn't been exposed to it, right? Yes. Yeah. And I think the, the truth of Triumph, too, is that uh, we were never like an A band. We were, but we were kind of like, almost an A band. We were like the top of the B level bands because we never had the airplay that, you know, I don't know, Bon Jovi had had, you know, 
but we'd never had the promotion that like Ozzy Osbourne had had experienced. We'd never sold as much records as Rush. Like, so that was a, a comparison that happened always right away. You know, you talk about being Canadian and stuff. Like, no matter where you went, Rush was always the Canadian trio that had sold, you know, 10 times the amount of records. <laughs> you know, yeah, you know. And the other thing was, and I'll say this for the benefit of you and, and the people that view your show. There, there are bands like Voivod or, or you know, like heavy yeah. bands. And we were not a heavy, heavy band. So we were always a band that was trying to flirt with FMAOR radio, but maybe even trying to cross it over to AM a little bit. You know, could we have some, some pop? And I didn't mind that. Like, I could have wrote pop songs. I could have written pop songs, mm-hmm. you know. From, from the ground up every day all my career and I wouldn't have been unhappy you know I, I, I didn't mind writing pop songs but you know did the other guys in the band want to be pop no they were fighting against that but did they want to sell records like pop bands sold records hell yeah you know so there was always a thing about Triumph where it had a, a kind of a split personality you know or, or a multi-personality kind of and a lot of the really A-level bands they find a way to sort of be one thing and just be that like target that demographic thing with an arrowhead and just pierce it, you know. And we never really figured that out. We were always kind of splattering around a little bit, you know. All right, here's a here's some good uh, words of wisdom. No substitutes for work ethics. Is that no shortcuts? Yeah. Stop searching for shortcuts. Embrace failure. Um, I always tell people, and I don't know, this is from my experience in life, and I think you're kind of saying the same thing. Don't work smart, work hard. Don't work smart, work hard, because working smart is like trying to find shortcuts. Now, maybe you want to speak to what your philosophy on that is. Well, your readings, my, you know, that's part of my philosophical stuff that you're reading. Like, and I used to try to teach this to to, uh, college students, and and, uh, it's kind of something that I've always tried to live by. And like embracing failure, the, the you know I would say to folks, you, you want to know the secret of life? Here's one of them. 0.367 is the major league batting average, greatest of all time. Ty Cobb, and he failed more than six times out of ten. So he was the greatest of all time, and he failed more than six times. So wh- what do you think you are? It, you can get into the Hall of Fame if you fail seven times out of ten. You can get 300 batting average gets you in the Hall of Fame. I would say. So when you're writing songs, you think just because you wrote a song, yay. I go, no, you write 10 of them and three of them are good. Seven, seven of them are average or, or shit, you know. So, you know, um, that was one part of it. And, and if that's partly humility. You must learn to be humble in the face of the work because the work is what's important. And there's nobody that's uh, like in professional sports or that makes it in the higher levels of music. And like one of my heroes is, is Pat Metheny, not a heavy metal guy, <laughs> you know, not, not don't, don't get me wrong, Rick, Rick. I yeah. like all kinds of music just because we have the metal voice. I'm, I'm, yeah, you know, no, I, I know yeah, that, yeah, but yeah. I, you know, I know who your audience yeah, is yeah, too. Yeah, 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 so, sure, so sure. They're, they're kind of going, Pat Metheny. Oh, Pat Metheny who's it's, that? Pat Metheny. Come on, John Petrucci. <laughs> yeah. That's what I'm talking about. You know, so I, I get it, you know, and I've I've had to live it my whole life. But uh, uh, Matheny is an extremely humble guy in the face of the work. And it's what makes him so extraordinary that there's very few guitar artists on the planet that can reach the level that he reaches because he's humble in the face of the work all the time, all the time, you know. Mm-hmm. So... Um, there's very little that he does where the work wasn't put in front of the ego, you know, he's, he's very egoless. Um, and that's not to say that he doesn't have one. I'm sure yeah. there's guys that have been in his band that went, Oh my God, are you kidding me? The, the guy, I, I can't stand the guy. He's driving me crazy. You know, because I think, you know, when you're a band leader, you do have to, you have to, you know, have a certain ego. You have to have a certain say, I'm sorry. I'm a benevolent dictator, but I'm a dictator. We're going to do it my way, you know? So um, I don't know. I, Yeah, I mean, I think work ethic is incredibly important. Um, and part of that too is, and I think the book sort of makes this apparent, 
I, I'm a big believer in the perspiration, not the inspiration. Inspiration is great, but it can also be something where, you know, you smoke the joint and you're kidding yourself. <laughs> you know, it's like, it's not really the truth as Jimmy K might, might see it, you know. <laughs> uh, so inspiration, you know, okay. But if you put in the work and then it really is turning into something and it's starting to talk to you and tell you what it wants to be, then you're on to something. And that's just going to require more work in order to, to get it finished, you know. So I, I, I don't discount inspiration. I think it's it's a big part of things. Um, but um, I like guys that are uh, ready to work really hard. You know, I, I believe in pre-production rehearsals. <laughs> I believe in, you know, uh, dress rehearsals for tours, you know, and lots of it. And getting up the cameras and filming it and then sitting and watching that stuff and going yep this is crap yeah let's change this yeah let's not do this when trying first started and we were going around it and we were all in three guys in a rental car going from gig to gig we would have board tapes from the night before and sit and listen to them and anybody that has been in the business will tell you board tapes back in the day they were horrible because there was no reverb on them like they were dry as a bone and you know that you sounded awful but you got to hear every single mistake you got to hear and we would listen and i you know that to me was one of the that's one of my favorite memories of of being in the band is like doing that work sitting in that car going over that stuff making changes so that the next night we were gonna fix it did did the band ever open up for anyone very rarely like what happened with triumph was when we made our American deal with RCA, uh, we did get some tour support as part of that. Uh, and um, we decided, Gil had a lot of uh, intelligence uh, and experience about uh, PA systems and trucks because he'd had a little bit of a PA business that he'd run out of his garage. So he just kept growing that. And then, it, so Triumph literally went and signed like bank loans and and credit uh, the musicians credit union and we bought our own pa and lights and had our own tractor trailer and then we went hey rca when we go into cleveland or pittsburgh we want to go into the small theater and we want to headline our own show and they would go you're nuts you haven't had enough airplay to do that that's we're not going to do that we would say yeah but we can make a deal with the local FM radio station. They'll do a 99 cent ticket. So we'll go in, we'll be, uh, you know, uh, massaging our relationship with a promoter. We'll be getting bums into seats to see our show. And then we're going to put on a show. We're going to blow off flash pots and shoot off flamethrowers. And Rick's going to jump around and we're going to do this show where people are going to go, Holy shit. You guys missed that triumph show at the beacon theater last night. Next time we go, we'll have a legit ticket. We'll be getting some airplay. So that was how we built the band. We didn't do it by opening for other bands where you get 30 minutes and you get this much stage and, you know, you get nine lights and half the PA. Like, but that's not to say we didn't, you know, we opened for Alice Cooper once in Cleveland on a New Year's show. Um, We, uh, you know, we once did a, 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 a tour in Texas where we flip flop with UFO. So they would headline one night and then we would headline the other. They didn't necessarily like the nights where they had to headline because if we'd already gone on, we would have already had, you know, Explosive. lasers and yeah. flash pots and, you know, and they went like, Oh, we don't want to have to follow that crap. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So last question and I'll let you go. Is rock music dead? Uh, no. Uh, is the rock music business dying? Uh, that's that's debatable. I, I would say maybe, you know, um, is, is the digital universe morphing rock music so that it's becoming it's unrecognizable? It's in, there. it's in there, is it not? It's in there. Yeah, you bet. Yes, there. it surely is. So, you know, the future belongs to the people that can morph and adapt and can stay light on their feet and change direction. You know, I mean, we all hate the fact that politicians have, you know, turned the whole thing about pivoting into, 
you know, it's, it's a, pivoting is bullshit. But nevertheless, you know, that's the world we live in now. If you can't pivot, if you can't change direction, if you can't take the constant flow of change into consideration, you're in trouble, you know. And and um, now back to your question: Is does rock music have certain fundamental values that are so good that they will never go out of style? And I would say yes. I would say I can listen to a Chuck Berry record and go, oh, I get that. I, I get that that will never lose its charm. It will never lose its its quality. And I would say you can listen to a Deep Purple album and you can go, That's there's never going to be a 14-year-old boy that won't go, holy shit, that's great. Because it's great. It's It's truly a classic, great thing. That will never die will it become a smaller and smaller thing until it's sitting in the same place where you know when i was a kid there were jazz guys that were going like oh elvis and the beatles they ruined everything there used to be swing bands where you know where tenor saxophone players could get a paycheck riding in a bus you know playing all of these old dance halls so that that's gone and it's gone forever that's never coming back you know that that's what's going to happen to rock music too, but that doesn't mean that the, the the essential charm of that jazz stuff that's never that's never died. It, it still exists, you know. Has it become more of a historical library kind of thing? Yes, you know. Is that what's in store for rock? I I can't say. You know, um, it might. You know, certainly rock could not survive the onslaught of rap and hip hop. And that that became such a major market force that all of the kids in suburbia that used to gravitate to rock, they weren't gravitating to it anymore. It wasn't happening, you know. So um, that's ancient history, you know. So, yeah. yeah no. uh, so here we go. Let's go full circle now. Here we go. Back to the book, Reinvention, the poems, the autobiography. Rick Emmett's also coming out with an autobiography I guess in a year's time. Uh, maybe two, two and a half. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, it's all good. It's all good. We got the documentary to tie us over. So again, this is the 14th. This is going to be released. TIFF, Toronto International Film Fest, premiere September 10th. And I think it's coming out on Crave later on. Rock and Roll Machine by Triumph. The documentary by Banger Films. And the Metal Hall of Fame. Catch yeah. the band. Catch the band. On the 12th on the 12th of september that's really funky and cool so Rick, it's a cluster bang it's a cl <laughs> good timing basically that's what it comes down to great timing anyways thank you so much for being a guest thank you for your time and uh, we'll do it again okay jimmy and, uh, my pleasure all right okay I'm bye sorry. everybody <laughs>